And just like that, we're now live. Hello, everyone, and thank you for funneling in. Great to see a lot of the attendees here. Emmett Hall, thanks for joining us. Michael Kaiser, Peter Darley, Richard Vobber, awesome to see you all here. Another uh, Timothy Farmer, awesome to have you here. It's one o'clock, I'm gonna give it another 30, 60 seconds or so before we officially start it, but great to see the strong attendance here already. Um, Dylan Coles, Adam Quaite, awesome to have you here. Brian Bagby, thanks for joining us. Eric Valerai, great to see you here. Jim Malone, what's up? Ken Millette, happy, what's the day today? Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Uh, hello everyone, Kyle Richardson, thanks for joining us. Well, we pretty much have most people here, which is great. Um, we about 175 people sign up, which is great. See about 70-ish here. So most people as well will be able to attend uh, after the fact. So know this is being recorded and you can watch it anytime, anywhere after the fact. But we'll get started here. And I just want to first, first off, thank you all for joining us here for this important discussion. Uh, my name is Kevin Sofin, and I'm with WS Darling Company, and it's uh, hosted in, in conjunction with SmartFirefighting.com. Uh, we host a series of different webinars and podcasts to talk about innovation and challenges and issues going on in the fire service. And today we're talking about cardiology, heart health. Uh, you can see over my shoulder, uh, I'm maybe not going to be a full-time artist in my future life, but the webinar title today is uh, Healthy Heart, Happy Firefighter. And we have some very awesome, interesting thought leaders here today to talk about it. Um, Denise Smith with Skidmore, Todd LaDuke with LifeScan Wellness, and Bob Hannon with West Grove Safety, West Grove Fire. And today we're going to have, a, the format's going to be three different 10 to 15 minute long presentations followed by a roundtable Q&A. Throughout we're going to have some polls and I encourage you to put some questions, use the chat bar, and we want this to be active because it's all about you. So the webinar today, what's it about? Um, the U.S. Fire Administration names heart attack is one of the leading causes of death for active duty firefighters. In the last decade, about half of on-duty deaths were caused by heart attacks. Even with these crazy stats, there's still little known about what first responders can and should do to prevent these cardiovascular risk. We all know firefighting is extremely physically and emotionally demanding. It's dangerous work. It's heavy uniforms, overwhelming amounts of stress on the heart. And with the stress, along with being in a toxic work environment, where you're breathing in smoke, dehydration, gas exposure. This creates a perfect environment for cardiac issues. So we all know some of the things we can do from exercising, using less tobacco, not big drinking, getting more sleep. We'll talk about that, but there's so much more and you're gonna hear some dot leaders as well as some firsthand perspectives on what this looks like. So without further ado, I want all our speakers to give us about a one minute intro and then Denise Smith will lead us off into her presentation. Then we'll go from Todd to Bob into the round table. So Denise, if you wanna give us a quick little one minute intro to start us off, that would be great. Well, good morning. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for being with us. I'm Denise Smith. I'm a professor of health and human physiological sciences at Skidmore College. I've been working on firefighter cardiovascular or physiological strain issues for about 20 years. And I'm thrilled to be here uh, with my co-presenters today, trying to bring to you some additional insights. We all know the statistics, but we wanna go far beyond the statistics and think about what we can do as individuals and what we can do as a fire service to improve overall cardiovascular health. Hey everyone. Uh Thanks for joining us today. I want to give a shout out to uh, to Darley uh, Company and to Kevin for all his work in corralling and organizing us and uh, um, making making this a, a presentation that's uh, come together today. So, um, as Kevin mentioned, my name's uh, Todd Leduc. Um, I retired uh, in 2019 after 30 years um, with the Broward County, Florida Fire Rescue Service as Executive Assistant Chief. I joke all the time, uh, I got one day of retirement in, I failed that test miserably um, and went to work in the private sector with um, following my passion, um, which is firefighter um, health and wellness and survival. Um, and I joined uh, LifeScan Wellness Centers, the nation's largest provider of uh, NFPA 1582 physicals as their chief strategy officer. Um, 
I also have uh, had the pleasure to serve as an elected board member for the uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs uh, Safety, Health and Survival section for the last 15 or 16 years. So uh, I'm delighted to be with friends today and delighted to um, share some thoughts on um, what we continue to see as a cycle of losing um, brothers and sisters in the fire service from uh, what largely are preventable um, cardiac events. So uh, thank you for joining us. And hello everybody, my name is uh, Bob Hannon. I'm a, a firefighter with the West Grove Fire Company. I've been the, with the, uh, in the service for about 30 years now. I've held the roles of a firefighter, lieutenant, captain, assistant chief, and currently a safety officer with West Grove. Um, also a Pennsylvania State Fire Instructor, a suppression level, and I teach part-time at the Chester County um, Fire Rescue Academy uh, with new recruits. And part of that, it really is fitness, safety. We really try and emphasize that. And uh, it really allows me to, you know, I've, I've been delivering that message for quite some time. And with, with some recent changes in my life, uh, I have some more information I could share with those folks. I'm really glad to have that platform to do it, as well as this platform today. I do want to thank the folks from Darley and my co-presenters for uh, allowing me to, to speak with you folks. Uh, I've been with West Grove for about 20 years, and prior to that, with a different department, uh, Glen Olden for 10. So, thanks. Kevin, back to you. Thank you all again for being here, and, and just really an important discussion. And as Todd said, it's, it, it, it hurts us all whenever there is a, a death that is preventable, um, especially with something that there's so much data and information on there. So without further ado, we want to try and give you perspectives from a science-based perspective, a practical perspective, and firsthand perspectives, which for all the panelists here. So Denise is going to lead us off. And, and again, throughout this, we're going to have some polls and some questions and, and put some questions into the chat bar. We'll answer them during, after, or, or after the event. Um, so without further ado, Denise, if you could take the floor and, um, and let it rip. Well, thanks so much for the introductions. Um, I'm not certain it's a great thing that I'll go first, but, but let me try um, to outline what I want to do. There is so much complex science that helps us understand why cardiac events are so prevalent in the fire service. And what I wanna do is talk through those with you, but really from um, a certain perspective. We were recently awarded a Better Heart Grant through the AFG program. And what our intention was there was to compile the best science, medicine, and research literature to produce evidence-based recommendations for enhanced cardiac screening. So I'm gonna go through some of what led us to these recommendations and how we got there. And in doing that, I wanna lay out the physiology and the pathophysiology for us so that those recommendations on screening, I hope will be uh, just make more sense to the firefighters who will talk, be talking with healthcare providers about them. Uh, this has been stated a couple of times already. I won't, I won't spend too much time here. This is data that everyone who's joined this call knows. Each year, based on NFPA reports, USFA reports, approximately 45% of the on-duty, line-of-duty acute fatalities are due to sudden cardiac events. And it's not just cardiac, fatal cardiac events that we're concerned with, but probably based on the statistics, 600 or 1,000 other firefighters suffer duty-related cardiac events that are non-fatal. And we don't even understand yet. We, we don't have um, a way to collect data on all the cardiovascular events in the fire service because we're not capturing them if they're not related to, the, to being on duty or within the 24 hours allowed by the hometown heroes. But the other reason I wanted to show this data that I think is critically important is when we think about other risks that the fire service faces, asphyxiation and burn injuries, which is what for civilians they think of as the greatest dangers of firefighting. But you see, those numbers are relatively low. And thank goodness they are. And in fact, we want them even lower. And the fire service invests tremendous amount of time and energy with training and tools and technology, equipment to keep these numbers as low as they are and to drive them even lower. And so what I want us to think about is how can we use education and training, tools and technology? How can we use information 
to get the cardiac fatalities lower because I'm certain that we can. So here's a, let me start with just key data. Like I, I am doing the science part of it. So here's some key data for you. Firefighters are approximately 50 to 100 times more likely to suffer a cardiac event after firefighting or fire suppression activities than they are at the duty station or during routine activities. Now that, that information was first published uh, in 2007 by Dr. Kales and his group out of Harvard. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's an astonishing statistic, right? In the medical field, we know that if you're doing heavy physical work like snow shoveling or running, you have an increased risk during that strenuous activity, but nothing like 50 to 100 times increased risk. And so that really was part of starting my career and trying to understand why is that true? And then in 2019, we published a larger study based on 20 years of autopsy data in the fire service. And we confirm essentially the same thing. Fire suppression activities are associated with a greatly increased risk of sudden cardiac events. And so we've done a series of studies now showing how the work of firefighting that involves many stressors from the physical work to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system to the environment uh, that includes a high heat, toxic products of combustion, particulate matter. These affect all aspects of the cardiovascular system. They, they affect the heart, a great deal more heart work. It can affect uh, the electrical stability of the heart. We've shown ECG changes. It dramatically affects the vascular function, the endothelium that lines the vessel walls. Presumably it can increase plaque instability because we have a, a greatly exaggerated inflammatory response. And importantly, in terms of the mechanism, mechanisms, we see an increase in blood, blood coagulability, increased number of platelets and activity of platelets, increased coagulatory potential. But it's important to note that most firefighters recover from firefighting without any untoward event. They need a little time to recover, right? In rehab or once they get back to the station, get showered up. So most people recover from firefighting without incident. It's not firefighting itself that causes a cardiac event, but rather firefighting can trigger a cardiovascular event in an individual with underlying disease. And so that's where we're gonna go now. And that's where I've been spending a lot of my time the last couple of years is to try to think about what is it about the intersection between this stressful firefighting work and the underlying disease state that makes firefighters vulnerable. And then asking the question, what can we do about it? So let me lay out something that I think will, will make pretty good sense to most firefighters in the audience, especially those with EMS background, when we talk about a sudden cardiovascular event during or following firefighting activity, in part, it's because of the pathologic, physiological changes that may be pathological, but it can really happen for two primary reasons. There could be a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, or there could be a sudden cardiac arrest. Now the fire service has long thought about sudden cardiac events being synonymous with or the same thing as a myocardial infarction. But in fact, that's not true. And here's another key statistic for you. When we did this 20 year retrospective study on all the autopsies from firefighters who died of a cardiac event, only 20% of them had conclusive evidence of a myocardial infarction. In other words, at autopsy, we could actually visualize, the medical examiner could visualize a clot in the coronary arteries. Now that number is far lower than many of us would have expected. It could be that more than 20% died of a myocardial, in, myocardial infarction, but we just couldn't see it. But it's a relatively small percentage. So we must also be thinking more and more about a sudden cardiac event and what might be prompting that. And importantly, importantly, we wanna know who is vulnerable, why it happens and how, because this allows us to design better screening modalities 
right? Because our ultimate goal isn't just the science of figuring this out, but figuring it out so that we can promote better screening technologies. So now you must forgive me. I am building a complicated <laughs> slide, but of course, only because the physiology and pathophysiology is so complex. Um, would you stay with me, please, as we look down the left-hand side of this slide, I think we see a pathology that's familiar to many of you. With atherosclerosis building in a coronary artery, you have a plaque formation, and that plaque formation decreases blood flow. So we call this a stenosis. Many of you have heard of that. In fact, when we talk about someone being identified with a 70% occlusion or 90% occlusion, often we're talking about the degree of stenosis created by this plaque. Now, in many instances, blood flow is able to go through that artery sufficiently that at rest, individuals don't even know that blockage is there. But it, during physical activity, when you're working hard, you can decrease the blood flow through that stenotic artery. The other thing that can happen that leads to an acute heart attack, right? That happens when the plaque ruptures, that plaque ruptures and a blood clot forms, so platelets come together and a blood clot forms, actually completely occluding the artery. That's what we know as a heart attack. Now, what I think is less familiar to many of us, it just hasn't been talked about as much in the medical literature. It's not as dominant in the public health messaging around cardiovascular disease. But with hypertensive heart disease or other conditions that lead to end organ damage of the heart, what we see are various conditions of cardiac enlargement. Um, if you read uh, the fatality reports put out by NIOSH, you see report after report after report showing cardiomegaly or an increased heart size, overall heart size. At autopsy, they measure the heart and it's far bigger than it would be expected for a person of that size. Left ventricular hypertrophy is talking about the thickening of the myocardium. And dilation is often a size of a long progression of disease. But what I want you to understand, these are critically important because they actually cause a remodeling or a change in the myocardium that replaces heart muscle that's able to conduct an electrical signal with fibrosis that can't. And so you get electrical instability that can lead to a cardiac arrest. So I know that's a lot and, I, and again, I. I apologize, I was asked to keep this relatively simple and I, I promise you I am, it's, it's even more complex still. Let me draw your attention to two more things. Coronary artery disease itself, coronary heart disease can lead to cardiac enlargement. It's one of the risk factors. And down at the bottom, it's also true at the very end when we're talking about terminal events, a person who's having a myocardial infarction often has a fatal arrhythmia that leads to sudden cardiac arrest. So there is overlap between these two conditions. Now, the final statistic I wanna give you here, kind of another key statistic to call your attention to is again, using that 20 years of autopsy data, we report that 80% of the cardiac fatalities, 80% of cardiac fatalities, firefighters who died in the last 20 years. It's not that they had one or the other of these conditions, but in fact, they have both. 80% of the firefighters have both conditions. And let me just pause here and ask you, how many of you have ever been screened to understand if you have any cardiac enlargement? I'm going to presume based on all that I know about medical screening in the fire service, that the vast majority of you have been being screened for coronary heart disease, and that's what you're more familiar with. But I wanna end this slide by asking, what is, what is it about these two conditions together? Why, how do we explain that 80% of the firefighters who die have both conditions? Here is what I'm proposing as a model. When a firefighter is doing all the physical work because of firefighting, 
that increases the need for blood flow to the heart to support the increased rate of contraction and increased strength of contraction. But because of the stenosis, stenosis due to the coronary heart disease, there's a relative state of ischemia. It's called demand and supply imbalance. You need a lot, but you can't get as much blood flow. Imagine having your fire hose kinked, you know, so that you cut off 50% of the diameter of the hose or restricted flow by 70%. Of course, you wouldn't have enough blood to supply to the fire. It's similar here. In, in the artery that's stenosed, you're not able to get enough blood flow to a heart that's beating harder and faster. And this ischemia doesn't just lead to angina, which is a, an outcome of ischemia, but in an individual with a structurally remodeled heart, there's an increased vulnerability to a fatal arrhythmia leading to a sudden cardiac arrest. Thanks, Denise. I saw one point question I know you're going on, but the, any thoughts on the recent study of the elevated incidence of AFib in firefighters within the recent study? Well, certainly uh, AFib is being found um, dramatically in the general population, right? This is a very, very serious condition that increases your risk of a heart attack, but also importantly of a stroke. And the report, uh, the recent report in the fire service suggests that self-reported incidence of AFib is higher in the fire service but I would note that that's self-reported. So it is a limitation of the study, but it's certainly um, concerning. <laughs> and it, it sort of adds to what I'm saying. It's one more level of complexity about the cardiovascular ch challenges that the fire service is facing. Now, one relatively good thing about AFib is that it's relatively easy to detect with relatively simple screening. And Denise, just two, two minute warning just for your presentation. Super. So what I wanna end with, I'm gonna go right to my final slide that combines the last three and we'll just talk about it. So the, the biggest point I wanna get at is if we know coronary heart disease and cardiac remodeling are present in 80% of the fatalities, are we doing enough to detect those conditions when we screen firefighters? And this is what most firefighters are familiar with. They're doing the coronary heart disease screening by evaluating risk factors. Now that's good, but my question is, is it sufficient? Even if you're doing a resting ECG with it, is it sufficient? Even if you're doing stress testing, particularly if your stress testing is submaximal. And many people in the fire service are doing stress tests to 85% of heart rate max, if they're doing any. And so what I'm saying is I think it's time for us to consider coronary artery calcium screening because it's much more accurate and it's not cost prohibitive and it only needs to be done every five years. Similarly, on the cardiac remodeling side, we are doing very little to even try to identify individuals with cardiomegaly. We know some of the risk factors, um, excess body weight, sleep apnea, hypertension, but those are much more often considered in the context of coronary heart disease. And yet a simple echocardiogram would pick this up and we're recommending that firefighters over the age of 45 receive both a coronary artery calcium scan and an echocardiogram to help us identify those two features that are prevalent in most of our cardiac events. Thank you. And Kevin, I hope I didn't go too long. Denise, you were awesome. And there's more to follow for that. So thank you so much. If you want to stop sharing your screen. All right. So next we have the wonderful Todd LaDuke, who I'm going to share my screen. And uh, thanks, Kevin and, and Denise. Thank, thank you so much. You know, it's always a treat to uh, to collaborate. Uh, you take such complex interplay that we know um, we we have in the landscape of cardiovascular events in firefighters, and and be able to uh, crunch it down into into twenty minutes. And we know it continues to evolve. So uh, 
um, what what are things we need to be thinking about? And I I kind of want to um, in the short time we have um, not necessarily do a deep dive, but just put some things on everyone's radar screen from the fire service perspective. You know, I wanted to look, and I think it's it's important to be mindful um, that this isn't just a slide that we're throwing up on the screen. Um, these are actual um, brother and sister firefighters that are no longer with us. They made the, the ultimate sacrifice um, to their community in, in protecting their community. Um, so I, I just want to pause before we, um, you know, the, the ultimate sacrifice should never be in vain. And we should learn lessons to continue to reduce and minimize the risk of cardiac death. So, um, but, but let's look at some of the findings in, in that group of firefighters that are no longer with us. Um, we know that um, high blood pressure um, has a significantly elevated risk for uh, sudden cardiac events. We know Denise talked about uh, that enlarged heart and in, in what are some of the causes of it. Um, we know uh, Denise also touched on uh, a prevalence uh, that if we have underlying cardiovascular disease, um, even if it's subclinical, um, that's an elevated risk. And I, and I think as we go through this, it's mindful with all due respect to other professions, we know that the rigors um, on the human body and the, the physiology um, of the, the human um, systems are under extreme intense demands from the rigors of firefighting, heat, stress, um, all, all the, the, what we call tactical athletes, the, the performance that we're expected to do. We know smoking um, has significantly elevated risk, but these risks are much higher in firefighters than in general population control. So we need to be thinking about with that magnified risk, the emphasis we place needs to be even greater um, in controlling that risk because of the work that we do. Um, here's the one that is just, um, you know, it's tragic in many, in many ways because it's, it's so uh, preventable, addressable, um, and it shouldn't come to a surprise to anyone that's been a first responder or been around first responders, 63% um, of those uh, fatalities um, were obese. Um, Denise just touched on, you know, with obesity comes hypertension, with obesity comes elevated blood glucose, elevated lipids, metabolic profile, and that enlarged left ventricular uh, enlargement that is so uh, places us at risk. So no surprise about obesity in the fire service, poor sleep, shift schedules, eating habits, um, on and on, high sugar, um, but it's a contributing factor to the cardiac cycle that we're seeing. You know, I hear all the time when we talk about physicals, and I know Bob's gonna touch on this, you know, I, I, I don't wanna have a physical because um, whatever my reason is, fear, I'm, I'm gonna be out of the service, I'm gonna not be able to do what I love any longer. Um, I've, had, I've had members uh, tell me, chief, if I have cancer, I'd rather not know. Um, but I think particularly when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, this is a great kind of put it in perspective um, snapshot. Um, one great reason, if not for yourself, um, and your family, um, is that when we hit the fire ground, when that alarm goes off and we go to work, um, our underlying risk become that same risk for everyone on that fire ground scene. If we go down, uh, it places everyone else on that scene in a precarious uh, situation for their own health, safety, and survival. So we need to be mindful of that. You know, I couldn't help uh, but, but throw this up um, for us to ponder on. Um, you know, we wouldn't, I would hope, ever think of not maintaining our apparatus and our fleet. You know, we spend a good portion of the beginning of our, of our shifts and our uh, on-duty time with assuring that the apparatus and the tools that we need um, to do what we need to do and to protect others and ourselves are in proper working order, whether that's checking the brakes, fluid levels, uh, all, all the preventative things. We would never not focus on that, I, I would certainly gather to, to think. 
Um, and we need to bring that same focus to our firefighters um, because their underlying um, health risk, if it's not identified, and that's really the key, right? If we, if we find something that we can identify, and Denise talked about enhanced screening, so that cardiac uh, echo and calcification uh, scoring for baseline, um, we, the earlier we find it, the more successfully we can intervene and control it. It's when it lies there dormant and we either ignore it or we're not screening for it um, that we, we place ourselves in extreme risk of having tragic consequences. You know, I just want to take uh, a Ty, just so you know, the poll, the, the poll, I think it was, the, the, we did the other poll about the how many departments have a health and wellness and it was about 50 50. I saw that yes in the poll like just now I think close to 96 percent um, have a preventive maintenance. Uh, on you know that that's uh, that's probably my next article so when you're reading prior engineering next month um, keep an eye out for that one just think about that so 50 of our 50 percent of our folks on today's call on the departments don't have a health and wellness program necessarily in place yet overwhelmingly, we have a health and wellness for our apparatus. Um, we, need to, we need to make those priorities as at least equal, if not uh, putting our, our folks' health and survival first. But I, I want to take um, a moment and just do a snapshot of some survey research that was done by the International Association of Fire Chiefs um, over a 10-year period. So the, the takeaway on this is having just said what I, what I said on my, my soapbox, um, what we found in this survey research was in career departments, um, still 20% of career departments uh, were not providing uh, occupational or firefighter physicals um, to, their, to their members. And that number was even um, higher in volunteer departments. Um, that, that number was even higher than that. So um, as a fire service, we need to, focus, continue to focus on our uh, providing occupational physicals for identifying that underlying cardiac risk. Let's take a look at the next one, drill down just a little bit further. You know, when, Sorry. when, I, when, I, when I look at that um, in 2016, look at, uh, look at, are we getting it right? You know, so in the fully career departments, um, you know, we're, we're not quite giving everyone a 1582 physical. Uh, in the volunteer departments, we have even more work to do uh, with regards to NFPA 1582 physical. And, and again, I, I look at NFPA 1582 as being a baseline, right? That, that's where, um, as a fire service, it's a consensus standard that's out there for us. Um, Denise, in her work and in, in all the brilliant minds that she's brought together in the research, um, is saying that we probably need to have enhanced um, physical screenings for detecting subclinical cardiovascular disease in firefighters. Uh, but look at how many departments uh, aren't doing at least NFPA 1582. And the ones that are doing physicals, many of those are not uh, even 1582. They're standard general occupational. So I I briefly, know, briefly tell us what is 1582 for those of us that don't know what it is, just really quickly. Sure, absolutely. So the National Fire Protection Association um, is, is the guiding um, body of, of uh, consensus standards for the fire service, whether we're talking about um, apparatus specs or SBA or rehab standards. Um, and that same standard, thank you, Denise, uh, that same standard uh, is out there and is updated on a, on a regular basis with regards to conducting firefighter, both Entry level and incumbent physicals. Um, so that that's uh, um, out there. We can see from the, some of the data from 2016. We have more work to do. We can see even from those on on today's webinar about uh, just under um, three quarters. So right around two thirds um, of the departments are doing a 1582 physical. Um, the remainder are either not getting a physical or it's, it's a general population of physical. And we know um, just with the, the United States Preventative Task Force recommendations um, that tell us what age to get a colonoscopy at, what age to get screened for uh, breast cancer mammograms, 
Uh, those are for general population. Hopefully with Denise's presentation or portion of it, we know that firefighters have very unique specific health risk uh, that far transcends general population in, in many areas. We can, we can take a look at the next slide as well. So this is a resource that was developed by the IFC. And again, we don't have time uh, to today in today's presentation to do a deep dive into uh, NFPA 1582. Um, but we put together, and Kevin, that was a great question. I, I don't want to uh, presume that we can, we can do a deep dive into 1582. But we have the Emergency Services Roadmap to Health and Wellness that the International Association of Fire Chiefs work to put together um, and it does that deep dive for you whether you're a volunteer department whether you're a union leader whether you're a chief um, it, it walks you through how to implement not only 1582 but how to establish a health and wellness program in your department i just want to uh, Showcase. This is my own department, and, and I mentioned um, I retired as executive assistant chief recently um, in Broward County, Florida, about a 900 person department um, in life scan wellness centers, who I now um, am an executive for. Um, we do their physicals, and I, I just wanted to put this up because this is a department that really didn't have um, NFPA 1582 physicals in place prior. Um, so uh, LifeScan does a, a full NFPA 1582, 1583, which is the physical fitness uh, standard in assessment. Uh, and then we do uh, some enhanced imaging, which Denise uh, kind of touched on the cardiac uh, ultrasound and, and some other ultrasound imaging. Uh, but just look at some of these numbers. This is no names attached, just a department overview. Um, Folks that had um, on imaging on cardiac ultrasound enlarged left ventricle, 37. We had uh, a number of folks, 60, uh, walking around with either undiagnosed or not well managed stage one or stage two hypertension. Um, a number with um, uh, changes in the aortic root size, which is a risk. So, again, I want to drive home that those are all. Uh, risks that, if not properly identified and managed, really place those individuals um, on a pathway for potentially tragic consequences for not only them, but for the department and their families. So uh, the importance of early detection can't be uh, stressed enough. And I just wanted to put some numbers to show you. My department, I'm sure, is no different than most others out there that when we first start doing physicals, we're going to identify that risk, which allows us to start addressing it proactively before tragedy strikes. Todd, one, one minute. All right, sounds good. Well, let's, uh, let's skip. That's just one of my firefighters that's alive today because of early detection. Um, this is, again, LifeScan sees uh, 47,000 first responders a year. This is a, and I'm happy to share this with folks. Um, this is just the same national overlay of when you start looking at early detection, um, the types of numbers that we find things, and we shouldn't be scared by that. That's the whole purpose of doing occupational specific physicals is to find that risk and to identify it early. Next slide. Um, again, I'm not going to do a deep dive, cardiovascular, pulmonary testing, fitness assessments, the enhanced screenings that Denise talked about. The cardiac uh, imaging, um, you know, is something that uh, uh, we know uh, the prevalence, Denise shared the numbers with us of not only underlying cardiovascular disease, but combined with left ventricular function. We know if we identify um, that early, uh, we can start intervening, whether that's controlling blood pressure, whether that's reversing weight gain, um, those items that are driving that. But we're not going to find that if we're not looking for it. So that's really the, the key, um, is we need, to, we need to make sure we're getting occupationally appropriate um, exams. You know, I, I love my primary care um, internist to death, but I think I'm one of three firefighters um, in his practice. Um, we just saw Denise took years and years of research and data and crunched it into eight, nine, 10 slides in 15, 
minutes. So for even our healthcare providers to keep up with this evolving research um, is a challenge if that's not your entire practice of seeing um, firefighters and first responders. Thanks, Kevin. I know a uh, ton of information and, a, and again, a small amount of time. Hopefully this is we're threading the needle together here uh, between Denise's overview and mine. And I'm, I'm really uh, can't wait to, to hear Bob um, share his story because really everything that we're talking about, um, Bob has lived. So uh, yep. Bob, uh, you. you're up. Thank you, Todd. And yet Bob, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Denise. I mean, it was actually it was interesting to hear a lot of the, uh, the more of the technical, the medical terms. I mean, I heard a lot of it during my, my story and, uh, you know, I had a little better understanding about some of it. And actually, a lot of the things you talked about, I had. So um, it's, 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 it's good information. First, I want to give a little background on our department. Uh, you know, it's, we're in southeastern Pennsylvania. We cover about 80 square miles as the first due. We're a combination department and we have three stations. We have 85 active volunteers and 32 career staff. We have run approximately 700 fire and 3,000 EMS calls per year. And we also cover three states. So we, we go across state lines. So we're, we're a busy department. We, uh, you know, it's a large area we cover and we have a lot of, a lot of members. So you know, it's one, we wanted to make sure we're taking care of our members in the best way possible. One of the things I really like about the department is they're very progressive. All right, and progressive, I mean, with, from a safety perspective. A lot of things they do just, you know, kind of safety being an underlying, you know, um, component to everything we do, uh, you know, with training, with, with responding to calls, with going to you know, actual performing at calls, everything we're doing is safety, you know, is safety focused. You know, some of the initiatives we've done over the years is we went in 2006, so we got rid of our last open cab, went to all enclosed cabs. In 2008, we went a little farther. While we had seatbelt use, it wasn't really actively enforced, and I'm sure a lot of departments may have that same problem, but we made it to the point where that apparatus does not leave the station unless the seatbelts are fastened. If an officer or the driver is caught driving with people that aren't belted in, they, literally, they can be suspended. So we made it a very enforceable standard, and we have, again, it's all, all driven towards the safety uh, aspect of the department. Um, we went to physicals in 2012, NFPA-compliant physicals. And just another thing, we went to what's called the transitional attack in 2014. All these things are going towards trying to make an, an inherently dangerous job, as uh, Todd had said, safer for our employees and safer. So, you know, we, we, no one wants to have that conversation where we're going to have somebody go to a call and not come home. We want everybody to go home. All right. So how did the fiscals become a part of our culture at West Grove? Uh, it was talked about and some people looked at it. But one of the real driving forces, I think, was one of our chiefs at the time. His father was a line of duty death in the, I believe, late 70s, early 80s. He was um, responding as a volunteer firefighter in the back of an ambulance, and he had a heart attack. He did not survive. And, you know, it was back then, it was you know, even in an ambulance, he died. So that, you know, just shows you, it's in the, just because you're, you know, you're around AMS does not necessarily mean you're going to have a good outcome. And they found out later it was an undiagnosed condition that caused that. Whether they could have stopped it or not, you know, we'll never know. But the fact that it was undiagnosed, we definitely couldn't have stopped it. So, you know, there was a lot of pain and anguish in his family with that, but just think about it from you at a department level, as, as an officer, if you're chief officer, um, you know, having to go knock on somebody's door and say, we've had a line of duty death, whether it is performing the job, you know, an interior attack or, you know, somebody gets hit by a car at a scene or a medical event. All these are extremely painful. And, you know, I fortunately have never had to do it in my career, um, but I can't, you know, just think about having to go knock on someone's door, talking to their their husband, wife, mother, father, their kids, and say, you know, your mother or father is not coming home. Your son, daughter, they're, you know, they're, they're never going to come home again. You know, and if you could have prevented that by doing something such as a physical program for your members, I mean, it's, it's an outstanding benefit with, with the cost involved that you could do. So, you know, at least you can try and minimize having to go have that conversation for that preventable reason. We know we have pre-plans and things we do on building attacks so that we, we do things as safe as possible in an inherently dangerous business. This is just one more tool you can put in that tool bag. You know, some of the objections you're gonna have cost. You know, it is expensive. You know, we, had this, you know, we have a variety of townships we, we work with. I think there's uh, seven at this point. And we went to them and basically we brought the statistics very similar to what Todd had shared and what Denise has shared as you know, with, with the health and, you know, cardiac events, other events, uh, you know, cancers, how it's killing firefighters, and we wanted to start doing physicals. 
it was a pretty easy sell to our townships. They all looked at it, they absolutely saw the value and they bought in. Now, not everybody's going to have that benefit, but you know, if you think you, you know, it's going to cost to be an issue, talk to the people that you're, you know, are putting, you know, giving you a budget and have a conversation with them. It's, you, know, you may be surprised with the answer. The biggest objection we had was member objections. I know Todd had mentioned this, and that's, you know, people saying, you're trying to put me out of the fire service. You know, you're, you're trying to, you know, you want to retire me. You don't want me coming around anymore. And that's absolutely nothing was farther from the truth. You know, so part of the goal, you know, as officers, when, you know, I think I was a captain at the time, was going and talking to your crews and saying, look, that's not what we're trying to do. You know, uh, recently I've had conversations with some other chiefs in, in my county and they're like, well, I don't want to take all my drivers out of service. You know, if there's a problem, and they said, okay, let's look at the other side of that. Would you rather they have a problem driving somebody down the road or would you rather know about it up front and try and prevent that? Because if they have a problem going down the road, you have a much bigger problem on your hands now. So, you know, but there's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but member objections, it's a hard sell. You have to even make sure, you know, you talk to your members and really stress the benefits, but you need to have buy-in from leadership and, you know, from the company as a whole, or it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's going to be hard, to, hard to get through. Our logistics were somewhat of a challenge for us. Again, with the numbers of members we have trying to do a physical program, um, the way LifeScan works, which is who we use, is we get nine members through a day. So at about 120 members, if we were doing nine a day, we'd be there for three or four weeks doing it. So what we do in our case is we go every two years. And a lot of the stuff is baselining or checking things. Normally, you don't have a condition. And you know, we, we decided, you know, after our research, go that, fa you know, that far that doing it every two years versus every year is going to make a lot of difference. We're generally going to catch most things within that year. And if we have a new member come in in between that, they do have to get a physical before we're allowed to set foot on apparatus. So we, yeah, we, and we really enforce that and we want to make sure it's, it's covered and we've had pretty good success with it. And, you know, to, to Todd's numbers, generally every year we see three or four people that have a condition that, that was undiagnosed that we're catching. And in fact, this year, when I went into my, um, for my physical, I was uh, talking to another member that was there and he wanted to thank the person that was doing the ultrasounds because two years ago, they had found something with uh, a mass in, in one of his organs that he was told by his doctor, had it not been diagnosed, he would not be here. He'd be dead. He wouldn't be there talking to me right then and there. And he had no symptoms. It just was something that was happening. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely something you should be looking into. All right, now let's get into my story a little bit. So as I said, I, you know, I had my physical this past year in September and I went through my lab review, you know, your hearing, your eyesight tests and the organ ultrasounds. And, you know, on that hearing part, it's kind of funny. My wife still cannot believe every time I go, I pass the hearing test. I tell her, I swear to God, I have to show her my results. She does not believe I can pass that, but I am able to pass that. So, but, you know, so I got through those two and there was no problems with my organs, no problems with my blood work or any of those other things. Uh, and I was doing a stress test and then, you know, there was a problem during that, you know, it was about 10 minutes into it. And they were noticing a high number of PVCs or uh, premature ventricular contractions. What I understand, again, I'm not, I'm not a cardiologist, but they're supposed to go up and while you're exercising, they're supposed to start coming back down. Well, mine were going up and they weren't, they weren't slowing down. So they stopped me right then and there. So you, you can't continue. And at that point I was put out of service. So what I did, you know, and the funny thing is on this is, you know, you talk about these conditions, you know, how, you know I had absolutely no symptoms. I never felt fluttering heart. I never felt my chest, you know, a skip beats. I felt absolutely nothing. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm not, picture fitness, but I mean, I, I walk three or four miles every day and I, I you know, never had any kind of a symptom. So, you know, it was kind of a surprise when it happened, but I went to my cardiologist to get checked out. So, you know, so, you know to me, that's the scary part. There was nothing indicating to me I had something wrong. So I'm just, well, I'm a walk, I'm a ticking time bomb. So I discussed with my cardiologist, the, you know, the findings and he looked over the, the printout of the EKG and he wanted to you know, consult with his, electro, his partner, who's an electrophysiologist who generally I believed more is the electrical pieces, well, components of the heart. That's what their specialty is. So after they conferred, they wanted me to go get a cardiac catheterization, which is the lab where they put the probe, you know, the, the, either up your arm or into your groin, up through an artery, and they check out inside of your heart. And during that test, they did find a major blockage in my lad or the left interior descending artery. And it was 85% blocked. And from what I understand, that's also known as the Widowmaker, because if that one goes, you know, and I talked to friends of mine that, that work in hospitals and they're a doctor. They said, you'd be the scene with all the people in the world with AEDs. We're probably not bringing you back if that thing dropped you. So I was a ticking time bomb, basically waiting to happen. And again, I had absolutely no symptoms. So when they were checking it, they also realized they were not able to stent it because of its location and just the blockage. So they decided a bypass is going to be the best option. 
you know, fortunately, I was, a, I was a candidate for what they call robotically assisted, which is much less invasive. They don't have to crack your chest to take out your rib cage and work on you that way. So the recovery was a little quicker. So I had my surgery on Friday, November 20th. It went well. Let me tell you, though, the first two days I post up, I thought I had felt pain before. That was just unbelievable. When it had you walking around the hall, it was like if somebody was sitting on my shoulder, stabbing me in the chest as I was trying to walk. It was just brutal. Fortunately, a couple of, by the third day, when I was scheduled to go home, it felt much better and I was able to kind of walk around without a walker and, and pretty much any assistance. So it did recover pretty quick. And so I was home on the 23rd with, you know, instructions, uh, light duty, nothing, no heavy lifting, but, you know, I can walk stairs. I can go out and walk around the neighborhood, you know, like walking a dog kind of patient and no, no aggressive walking or anything like that until follow up in uh, mid-December, which at that point, the, the surgeon, the cardiothoracic surgeon cleared me, said I'm good to go. So at that point, I had an appointment with my cardiologist the following week. I had to follow up with him to find out, okay, am I, you know, is he going to sign off on my NFPA 13, uh, 1582, which if nobody's ever seen the list of requirements for on that, they have to sign off on. I can't imagine a cardiologist want to do it for someone in their 20s, much as someone in their mid-50s like me. But he said, you know, he would sign off, but he just wanted to, um, he wanted to have me do another stress test. And I was kind of curious as to why that, why that was, is that, you know, he said, it's, you know, while it was great, we found a blockage. That actually wasn't why I was having high PVCs. He said, you know, that wasn't the cause for that, which was, you know, they, they found a blockage, which had to be fixed, but the stress test actually wasn't finding that. It was, was more the irregular heartbeat. Now, he had a sense of just my medication, but what he wanted to do before he would clear me was have an additional stress test. So I did have that in January, and I was able to pass that. So I was, you know, I was go ahead and I was put back into service uh, on January 22nd. So I'm back in full service now, which is, uh, which is great. You know, my wife's happier. She knows, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm in good health, but it's, you know, it was all really basically that true back to, to the, uh, the stress test and the physical that we had that without that, I would never have been down the path to find that. And I still wouldn't walk around as a ticking time bomb, you know, just pretty much want to wrap up saying, you know, my wife, my kids, my family, they, they can't thank my fire company enough for providing the, the, the life scan physical, you know, it literally saved my life. You know, the, the people on this call that are, that are thinking about it, they're on the fence, they're not sure if they can do it for cost, for objections. By all means, look at it. it it's absolutely, to me, one of the best things you could do for your fire company and your members. I mean, you know, they, they may not want it. They may not know they want it, but trust me, they want it. I mean, you know, I told people when it happened to me, is it, is it possible to be mad and happy at the same time? You know, I was mad they found it, but I was kind of glad they found it because of the alternatives. So, but that's, uh, you know, that, that's my story. But, you know, I mean, it was just one of the things I wanted to do after that is I, yeah, I just say I wanted to share this story. So if I could save even one other person, make someone go get a physical, make someone you know, get, go, you know, get checked out, make sure you take care of yourself because you may not be seeing symptoms, but there's a lot of things to be hiding under the covers that you just don't know about. Thanks. Well said, Bob. A really, really inspirational story and good on you for yourself, but especially your family for, for uh, having the courage to go get tested. And I know Todd, you talked a lot about, People don't want to get tested for a myriad of reasons, but it's you really got it's it's selfish to not doing it not not only for yourself but for the firefighters around you and your family. And as we know, it's it's not rocket science. It's actually quite easy, and the resources are there. Um, hey, Kevin, let me just um, let me throw out there too. I mean, I know we're talking cardiac today, but really, this is most any disease process, right? So we know even with cancer, which is so prevalent in the fire service, if we find it at stage one or precancerous, I mean, survival rates are, are really phenomenal. And if it, 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 we find it in later stages, unfortunately, um, just like cardiac events, you become a statistic. So uh, I, I really, I wanna commend Bob for sharing um, his personal story because um, having worked as a paramedic for many, many years, you know, you, you think about how many folks um, did not have really detection and the outcomes are just so much different. So uh, I, I know uh, we're, we're definitely hopefully uh, turning the corner as a fire service, just culturally with making this not, not only acceptable, but making it the norm rather than the exception. So. Yep. So Todd and Denise and Bob, we got a couple questions from the audience that I, that I extrapolated from the chat. If you got any final questions here, um, we, we've got you know, five, another five, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how much time you can, of course, drop off whenever it feels good. Um, but, but a few that I've seen that I, I think would be interesting is to talk about is everyone's always looking at technology to solve our problems. And, and granted, 
technology and a, and a widget is only good if you apply it and it, it brings you value and it can be used in a way to help do whatever you want it to do for you. Uh, but particularly within this discussion, there's always interest around wearables. And I think that's been a growing level of interest about how do we use technology for pre, during, and post monitoring of firefighters? So what, what's the, give us a little snapshot on how is technology and, and wearables in particular part of this discussion to help support this, this challenge that the first responder and fire service faces? Denise or Todd, if you want to start. Denise, you want to take that? Denise, you're on mute. Uh, sorry about that. I'm happy to jump in now that I'm unmuted. Um, I think wearables, for, for me, it's a really tough thing to, to answer in a balanced way. I'm very excited about the potential of technology to help us more. And there are some ways that it's helping us significantly now. Uh, the technology to detect AFib is really quite good, right? But that is to me, fundamentally different than our ability to detect um, issues around coronary artery disease, coronary heart disease or occlusion or ischemia on the fire ground. And I think some firefighters uh, are too optimistic. And I think some technology has been oversold in terms of right now being able to monitor firefighters and recognize an event before it happens. Now, detecting cardiovascular disease can be difficult, right? It takes a fair bit of testing. And even with the testing, if you think of something like an exercise stress test, not all of those are accurate. You have false positives and false negatives. But that's in a clinical setting where you can keep a person relatively still when they're cycling or when they're on a treadmill. You think about trying to do that on a fire ground and there are you know, so many problems you can't imagine it. So I think we must continue to push the technology side. We must, but we should also recognize the reality that right now for most conditions, the best we're gonna do is get really good medical evaluations to detect underlying disease. And please let me say, and advocate for aggressive preventative measures. Everything that you should be doing to prevent these cardiovascular events is also decreasing your cancer risk and ensuring that you can do your job more effectively. So yes, I'm optimistic about technology and I think it has a place, including in our preventive measures, motivating us to do our fitness programming, et cetera. But I don't think there's a silver bullet with technology right now. Well, well said. Todd or Bob, any, any thoughts, final comments on uh, technology and wearables and anything like that? I would just add in, um, I guess I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic than Denise with, and I think Denise's balance is right spot on. Um, but I, I think, and I just did an article on this on uh, as a mega trend, is I think the pace of technology development, you know, whether it starts R&D with, you know, uh, with NASA and, you know, the, the space program and uh, our military um, is is heavily invested in technology development. And so I think the pace of um, technological um, change is rapidly increasing. Added with that artificial intelligence and helping take technology and guide some of our decision making. I don't I agree with Denise. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think that's an area we, we have to keep an eye on and invest um, as a fire service in to help us in areas where it makes sense, right? Because we saw how complex this interplay is. It even gets more complex when we hit the fire ground with, um, with risk factors. So we'll, we'll see how and, and where it evolves, but some great questions around that front. The only thing with the technology from my personal experience is that not necessarily for finding conditions, but just to see what your heart does during a call. Uh, I was exercising one time and I went to a call and I had a chest strap on you know, for my heart rate. And it was a simple shed fire and I was, the, I was actually command. I wasn't pulling hoses or doing anything. And my heart rate still beat, spiked that. I think it was 184 beats per minute just from the adrenaline rush. So that's just for the you know, firefighters, how quickly your heart rate goes up. 
You know, I also have a, a watch, which does a heartbeat, and I do it when I go in a burn building and, and stoke fires with students and things like that. And I can see where your heart rate goes up there. And again, you know, 140, 150 is not uncommon just walking. I mean, not doing any heavy exertion. I'm not pulling a hose line. I'm not, you know, doing anything exhaustive. So just keep that in mind. That your heart is spiking. You're going from sitting in, you know, basically a completely sedentary to a full-blown, probably a, a, heart, you know, a heart, faster heart rate than most professional athletes would hit in some of what they're doing in a couple of minutes. And if we're not in shape which, you know, it's not good. Well, well said, Bob. So I, I, I want to, we'll go a little bit, a little bit past here, five, 10 minutes. And then of course people feel free to drop off, but want to continue to share best practices and ideas. And there was, there was a couple questions about studies that are available, whether it's past or things that are ongoing. One question that Wayne um, Kiewicz, 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 sorry for butchering your last name, asked, are there studies that show a linkage between firefighting and the development of these conditions? So I think that that's one question. And then Denise in general, are there other studies happening right now that we should be aware of and, and where, where can we find that? Well, uh, I'll jump in on that. There are several studies. Uh, I, I think the last time I looked, there were approximately 13 large scale studies that tried to compare cardiovascular disease outcomes among firefighters to the general population. But everybody who, I mean, it's a great question, a logical question, but you, if you thought about it with me, you can also imagine some of the problems associated with that, right? Was that career firefighters or volunteer firefighters? Was it in a busy firehouse or a not busy firehouse? Did they control for other confounding factors like smoking? <laughs> Uh, what about, did everybody have the same shift schedule because that can affect things? But even taking that into account, most of those studies show that firefighters do not have a greatly different cardiovascular profile than the general population. If you're looking at underlying structural heart issues or risk factors. But of course the general population doesn't do work that is as strenuous as firefighting and can trigger events in someone with the same level. And one more thing, and I hate that I'm always giving complex answers, but the other thing we have to keep in mind is if you look at what's called the healthy worker effect, in other words, it's not fair to just compare firefighters to the general population because we exclude fire from firefighting people with known health conditions, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, coronary artery disease. So if you take into account the healthy worker effect, then there is evidence that firefighting has some effect on the progression of atherosclerosis. Um, so I, I think firefighting is linked with it, but if I, I just can't stop without giving the holistic picture. But what is far more important are lifestyle factors that are more under the control of firefighter. And that is healthy body size, healthy eating, and adequate fitness, no smoking. And so those are really huge things that the fire service can go after to decrease the risk. Kevin, I'm gonna jump in here and put it, cause I know we're, we're time limited and this is such a, I mean, just a meaty topic and Denise just laid out, you know, all the, even, you know, sub tentacles of it, nutrition, you know, uh, um, exercise. So I'm gonna put a shameless plug in for our, um, for our book, Surviving the Fire Service. At, uh, Denise has a whole chapter in there um, with Dr. Stephanos Kale's uh, uh, great friend and, and collaborator um, on cardiovascular, but, um, you know, whole chapters on nutrition, on fitness um, by some of the, by some of the, not only the great friends, but some of the leading experts in, uh, in the fire service on these. So um, we're donating a portion of the proceeds to firefighter health and wellness uh, research. Um, so just, uh, it's a resource that's out there. Um, certainly we're not getting rich in selling a book, but it's, it's, um, a one-stop shop for a lot of this information and the latest studies that are out there. If anyone is interested in a deeper dive. And I just put that in the chat bar. Thanks, um, Kevin. So, so it's two or three or three minutes past, but I, I guess one, one final thing would be great here is if Bob, Todd, Denise, you all have 60 seconds left to give just one final thought, just a, just a mic drop of a final comment, question, challenge, whatever it may be. Um, so it's kind of putting you in the spot. Denise, Bob, Todd, whoever wants to start, 
Um, just kind of one final thought here. Yeah, I, I, I'll start like, thank goodness that all the people are here on this webinar, reflecting their interest and concern about this topic. That's the biggest hurdle we have to overcome. And so I think if the people here carry this message of getting the medical evaluations we need for firefighters that firefighters deserve and promoting the prevention that we know will help, we're gonna do tremendous good. This was a great one hour, but what's really gonna matter is what the people on the webinar go out and do with it. But as I say, I think we've already gotten over a huge hurdle with everyone here because they care about the issue. Thanks, Denise. Bob? All right, yep, I'll go next. Uh, first off, uh, like Denise said, I'm really, really happy to see the number of people that are on this, you know, this webinar that are interested in this. And, and it's a lot of people, and again, my, one of my goals was to share my story and hopefully help some other people. But I can just emphasize, it, get, you know, get, get, get physicals for your members. You know, even if you can't, for whatever reason, afford or get approval to do the NFPA compliant ones, I know Todd's not gonna like this, but at least go see your doctor, get something. It's, something's better than nothing. I would advise getting the NFPA once because there's so much to cover in that that it's not going to be covered by your doctor. I know I take my packet to my doctor and he looks at it and he's just like, they did all this. I mean, they, they're not even aware of all the things that we're doing on there or why you would want to do all that. It, it, they just don't, it, they, they don't get it. So, but you want to make sure you're getting this. Again, it's the best thing you could ever do for your membership. I think better than, a, you know, find them a shiny new truck or new gear or, or other things or training. This should be top of your priority list. Thanks. Thanks. And Todd? Yeah, no, um, I, I echo um, the, the rest of the panel. It's um, it's tremendous to see. I tell people, you know, uh, 10, Bob knows this, Denise knows this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you'd have three people in a room talking about firefighter health and wellness and safety. And, you know, we had uh, close to several hundred, I think, registered for, for today. And, uh, um, you know, a, a couple of things right, just to close. Um, I echo, um, you know, Bob's um, um, imploring folks to focus on their on their members. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, a spring Texas firefighter. We didn't have time today to play the video, um, but he has a compelling, compelling quote, and it's simply this: for less than the cost of the dress uniform to bury me in. His department invested and in, in provided a, a comprehensive occupational early detection physical. And that's always stuck with me um, because uh, this is what it's about is investing in our people um, so they can have a long and healthy service to their community and hopefully um, enjoy a long and healthy retirement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll echo two additional thoughts. Um, the apparatus maintenance, I, I want to drive that home, that we would never take a truck out uh, knowing that the brakes weren't working or just, you know, guessing that the brakes work. Um, and then Denise's um, line that she she's kind of correlated and it stuck with me, um, that we would never, I would hope, uh, not do a complete 360 scene survey of our structure or our scene when we arrive to, to know situationally what we're dealing with. And that's really how we need to think of our own health. And Denise, you know, kind of laid that out um, in, in some prior work and it, it's resonated with me that um, that's really all we're doing is doing a 360 of our health every year or um, as frequently as we can um, just to see what's out of balance, what we need to be focusing on. And it's nothing to be afraid of if we find it uh, Bob's, Bob's case is, I mean, just a walking textbook example. We find it, instead of it being the Widowmaker, we can change the name to the survival vessel, um, you know, courtesy of early detection. <laughs> so that, that's what it's all about. I, I commend everyone. Um, by virtue of you taking an hour out of your day, you're a leader in the fire service. Uh, by investing in, in educating yourself now, as Denise said and Bob has said, um, go forth and, and do good with this information. This is a recorded uh, webinar, so it, it will be available. You can share it throughout your circles and your departments and your regions. Um, but let's continue as a fire service to make change. So uh, needlessly, we don't continue to see the same cycle of preventable line of duty deaths repeated. And thank you, Kevin. And again, I wanna shout out to Darlie. I know when I reached out to, uh, to your CEO, 
um, about this concept and putting this all together without hesitation. Darlie stepped up and partnered and um, thank you for, for your leadership. Of course, thank you all. You are, you're, the, you're the heroes and we're, we're just grateful and excited to be part of it. And this is a, an ongoing series. So we'll have more coming up. Todd and I will be working on uh, looking to do one a month around health and wellness. And there's some other, other smart firefighting webinars coming up around more technology focused. But nonetheless, thank you all. Stay safe. Have a great Wednesday and great week, week ahead. Uh, stay warm, whether you're in the Midwest, cold, or you're in uh, you know South Florida, where I know it's tough winter right now. <laughs> but uh, much love and thank you all for joining us here today. Stay well. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks.